Thank you all and welcome to another sold out Engage event. We're glad you have joined us. Um, before we begin, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our board members in attendance, Secretary Don Evans, Karen Prothrow, Ambassador Craig Stapleton, Ray Hunt, and SMU's President Gerald Turner. Thank you for being here. And speaking of being here, we also welcome people from SMU. Uh, the School of Education, Movements, and Mobilization class is here joining us, as are our friends at the Center for Presidential History. We're also pleased that tonight with us, Mark McKinnon and his crew from Showtime, the campaign docuseries, The Circus, uh, is here shooting footage, um, both backstage and in front. And that will be on on Sunday night, so make sure that you, uh, you check it or set your DVRs. <laughs> The, uh, the work of the Bush Center uh, is actually very important and tonight uh, is a good example. Uh, in addition to our mission of developing leaders and advancing policy and taking action, uh, we, we exercise our mission through our three impact centers, domestic excellence, global leadership, and our engagement agenda. You heard about some of those programs on the video. To be a great country, you should have strong economic growth, the best education system, treat your veterans right, and develop future leaders. And that's our domestic excellence programming. Under global leadership, it's about global health and advancing health and welfare, advancing the cause of human freedom and women's empowerment. And our engagement agenda is engaging with the world. And we do that through this beautiful building and programming like tonight and our partnerships with SMU. And so it's a delightful uh, excuse for all of us to get together and have a little fun. So this is a, this is a special uh, time of the year. Um, on Monday night is the first presidential debate uh, at Hofstra University. And tonight, we're fortunate to get the inside scoop on everything that goes on in presidential debates from preparation to performance. I can't think of anybody better to kick us off than the 43rd president of the United States, George W. Bush. Thank you all, sit down. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, Ken, thank you for your leadership. We're honored and thrilled that you are leading this organization. Uh, thinking about debates gives me a headache. Uh, they're, uh, they're tense events. And um, a couple of thoughts about them. I don't, it's hard to win a debate, one of these national debates, but you sure can lose them <laughs> by like mispronouncing a word, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, I was pretty good at that. Any, um, so uh, the preparation of the debates, uh, the first time around, going from governor to president was, was pretty intense because a lot of the issues were relatively new. It'll be interesting to see uh, Monday night how people handle these new issues that get, get thrown out, how they're able to describe uh, their visions. Second time around, I'd lived it, the presidency for four years is a little, a little easier. Both times around, however, it was a slight pain because my inquisitor, the person who played Gore and Kerry, uh, was Senator Judd Gregg, who is a, a dear friend and uh, really did a good job of making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, the lead up to the debates were always interesting because uh, at about maybe seven hours before the debate, everybody disappeared. Like, so you're like sitting by yourself in a hotel room <laughs> as if you had leprosy. Uh, before every debate, before I went on the stage, I had a tradition of calling my uh, friend, Kirby John Caldwell, who's a pastor uh, in Houston, and uh, we would pray. And it helped a lot. It really helped a lot. It kind of put things in perspective. Uh, I'll never forget in Arizona, my last debate, I had six presidential debates, and the last debate uh, was in Phoenix. and. For some reason, somebody thought it was a smart idea for me to kind of hang out with debate sponsors, and our little girls were there, and friends were there, as was Senator John McCain, my friend. And I was sitting on the couch trying to get the debate zen working. 
clear my head, and I see this face right in front of me saying, relax, relax. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, tonight, we've got a really interesting panel. Uh, professionals who know something about debates. The moderator is Jim Lair. Jim Lair uh, was the moderator of all three debates in 2000 and was the moderator of one of the three debates in 2004. The other one was Bob Schieffer and, and Gwen Eiffel. And he's really good. Really good because uh, as a moderator, he made sure that the focus was on the candidates, not on the moderator. And uh, I, I was really thrilled to be able to interact with him. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned Senator Gregg, and Kathy's with us. Thank you for coming. And the kids, I don't know if they wanted to see their father in action. Josh, Josh made it. That's good. Uh, and Merrill. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he really took his job seriously uh, in being Al Gore and, and John Kerry. I mean, he studied their speeches, he studied their mannerisms, and he was really effective. And as I said, he kind of made me feel inadequate. In the end, I was really happy I didn't have to debate him. <laughs> and finally, Karen Hughes, uh, who uh, made a significant difference, and Jerry's here as well, her husband, made a significant difference uh, during my time in public life. Uh, she had one of the best abilities to help phrase an issue so during the presidency, there was a, on my governorship, there was a big debate about English only. I was uncomfortable with the language of English only. It sounded very exclusionary to me. And uh, so prior to a press conference, we knew we were gonna get asked a question. And she said, you know what? Why don't you be for English plus? And so I walked out there and they were ready to grill me on English only. And I said, here's what I'm for, as opposed to what I'm against. Here's what I'm for. I'm for everybody learning how to speak English and I want my little girls to learn how to speak Spanish. Uh, Karen Hughes was a genius at uh, helping an old English klutz like me get out of a bind. At any rate, thank you all for coming. Thank you for support of the Bush Center, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the panel. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, I have to admit, it feels a little backwards for me to be moderating a debate with Jim Lair. <laughs> but of course, I'm not running for president. And neither am I. <laughs> and neither are you. Uh, in watching, I, in preparing for this event, I watched Jim's outstanding documentary that covered the history of presidential debates. And as I did, I noticed one constant, that there were many different candidates, but there was really one moderator who, who stood out and became known as Mr. Debate, and that was you. And how did, how did that define your career, and how did you approach that? Well, it, uh, it came about, Karen, because uh, uh, in the beginning, I was, my first debate was 1988, George H.W. Bush versus Michael Dukakis. And... Um, that went okay, and uh, then they, they, they were, at that time they, they would negotiate who the moderators were, and the, the, whatever campaigns were involved. And um, uh, it, I, they kept calling on me because they couldn't agree on anybody else. It wasn't because I was great. <laughs> well, that was the one thing that the Bush campaign agreed with the Al Gore campaign on that I remember in 2000 was that we both wanted you as moderator. One, in one, one case in particular, was uh, Dole versus Bill Clinton, and uh, I had I'd already, they'd already asked me, I'd already accepted I would do the first debate, and um, I went down to Colonial Williamsburg to do something, and very late at night I got a call from the representatives of both the Clinton and the Dole campaign and said, we've been arguing and arguing and arguing about the other moderators, will you just do them all so we can go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's how it happened. <laughs> now, Senator, Senator Gregg, uh, as President Bush mentioned, you memorably portrayed Al Gore. In fact, I think I remember saying I really didn't like you after five or six of our debate prep sessions. I recall that. Um, what is it about you also played Al Gore again for, to prepare Jack Kemp in 1996? What is it about you that channels Al Gore? <laughs> 
I think you folks looked around for the most boring person you could find. <laughs> <laughs> In public politics, and you picked me. Uh, first, let me just say that it's a great fun for Kathy and I to be here at the Bush Center. And Josh and Merrill, who just are our son and our daughter-in-law, who just moved to Texas, and I'm sure they're SMU fans. Uh, and to be here with Laura and President Bush is a great honor and a privilege. Um, you know, being Al Gore was a bit traumatic, not necessarily for me, but beginning in April, uh, long before anybody else knew we were doing anything in debate prep, I was asked to do this by yourself. And I started studying Al Gore, all he'd done before, all his debates before, all his speeches, all his press conferences, all his talks. Put video on the TV constantly, put... How'd you stand it? Cassettes in the radio. <laughs> and, and, and so, so the person who most suffered the most was Kathy, because she'd turn on the TV, there'd be Al Gore. She'd turn on the car radio, there'd be Al Gore. <laughs> and it was just overwhelming. Al Gore was everywhere in our house for about three or four months. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it, was, it was a very difficult experience for her. But for me, it was entertaining and interesting. But more importantly, I felt very strongly that this was a very important responsibility, that we were talking about the presidency of the United States. It was going to be decided, in my opinion, by the debates, and I think most people felt that way. And I had to be, I had to say and do what Al Gore was going to do, not what I was going to be thinking. I couldn't ad-lib anything. Everything had to be precisely what Al Gore would say in response to a question, how he would attack, how he'd make his positions. And so you really had to immerse yourself in the, in the, in the character. Well, let's, be, let's begin by, it, it always struck me that debating is not really a skill that is required of a president. Uh, a president is a chief executive and decision maker, not a legislator. So why do you think the debates have become so important? What, what is unique about them and makes them relevant to the process? It's the only time during a presidential campaign when the voters can see both candidates on the same, on the same stage at the same time talking about the same things. And they come late, they come like set the end of September or, or in October, and by then most people, according to the polls, and I checked for my book in fact, I checked, uh, went back and checked, for the most part people have already decided by then for whom they're gonna vote or they're leaning strongly one way or another. What the debates do is confirm or affirm Somebody's, hey, yeah, right, yeah, I'm, I'm for George Bush, that's great, yeah, it's fine. But they also realize, the American voters realize that I may not be for Billy Bob, uh, but Billy Bob might win, and he's going to be the president of my United States as well as the, the other people's United States. And they just want to take the measure of the individual. And so the debates become a kind of, just who is this person? rather than what does this person stand for, or what are the positions. For people who followed the campaign, they've already done that. They've already gone through lockboxes for Social Security and all those other things. And they just went, oh, do I like this guy? Can I see him, can I imagine him or her being President of the United States, making decisions that affect uh, sending young men and women into harm's way, that kind of thing. And how would they handle emergencies and, and uh, uh, the unexpected? Really, what it really is about, to, to, to be precise, it's what people are really looking for in these debates is, is can this person handle the unexpected? Because most presidencies, I, I bet you President Bush would agree with me, that that is what being president of the United States is all about. Is dealing with the, it's not what you say you're going to do. That's, that's all important. But it's really, oh my God, what if oh my God happens? What am I going to, is this person able to do it? I remember being struck uh, after 9-11 that of all the questions that I watched President Bush being asked in all the debates, in all the interviews over the course of the presidential campaign, not once was he asked about Al-Qaeda. Yeah. And yet, seven months into the Did presidency, they attacked, they attack, that's right. Same thing country. happened to Obama with the financial crisis <clears throat> and McCain. I mean, those two guys could barely probably add up four and four and get, I mean, four and four and get eight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, won't tell them you, I won't tell them you said that. <laughs> but at any rate, suddenly there's a financial crisis, and they have to deal with it. You know, I Senator also Greg, think, what are your thoughts? I, I agree with everything that Jim said, and it's taking the measure of the people who are running. And this is a form that has some originality to it, usually. But at the end of the day, as Jim pointed out, 40 to 45% of the folks on both sides of the aisle have made their minds up. 
And there, you're really talking to the 10 to 13% of the American audience who has not necessarily made their minds up. And whether or not they're going to be supportive usually depends on whether the person comes across first as likable. And second, as somebody who has a sense of leadership that's going to take America in a positive direction. If you win on those two points in a debate, if that's the message you convey, if, and it's not only conveyed orally, it's conveyed through physical activity, as I know we're going to get into, um, that usually settles the, the issue, in my opinion. Let's take a look at the very first modern era televised presidential debate, which was between John Kennedy <coughs> and Richard Nixon on September 26, 1960. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. People sitting home in front of their television sets on that September night 40 years ago could not have imagined they were watching the face of American politics change forever. But it was. And that first presidential debate had an immediate impact as well. It gave John Fitzgerald Kennedy a golden opportunity to introduce himself to millions of Americans all at once. For Vice President Richard Nixon, however, it probably was a major political miscalculation that cost him the election. Nixon had been sick, and his advisors urged him not to debate Kennedy. He was leading in the polls, and they feared sharing a debate stage with Kennedy could give the young senator equal standing in the eyes of voters. I should make it very clear that I do not think we're doing enough, that I am not satisfied as an American with the progress that we are making. This is a great country, but I think it could be a greater country. And this is a powerful country, but I think it could be a more powerful country. Richard Nixon agreed to debate John Kennedy, and the rest is history. The hot lights, the awkward introduction of the reporters, the lazy shave powder Nixon used to try and cover up his five o'clock shadow, and the beads of perspiration that began to show. Where then do we disagree? I think we disagree on the implication of his remarks tonight and on the statements that he has made on many occasions during his campaign to the effect that the United States has been standing still. Interestingly, you notice the setting was quite primitive and there was no audience at that debate. What, what difference in your experience does a live audience make in a debate setting? At the, the first debates that I did, they had a, the audience would applaud and sometimes cheer a little bit and whatever. And the people at the debate commission said to me, that's become a distraction. Do you, don't, do, you, do you not agree, Jim? And I said, yes, I agree. So they asked me the next time I debated, four, then four years later, if I could figure out a way to uh, uh, keep the audience quiet. You know, you wanted to have an audience because you had donors on both sides and supporters on both sides. So this, but these weren't people off the street. And uh, they, were, they were invited to come. And there were six, seven hundred or, or less, always less than a thousand people. Well, I decided that I would uh, use my marine training and other things. And I, I just stood up in front and t told everybody uh, that they, they were to remain silent. You know, no hissing, no booing and whatever. And the first time it really came true, it was your mother was sitting on the front row. <laughs> You kept Barbara Bush quiet? And no, no. I said, uh, I said to the people, I said, look, if you cheer or make a lot of noise for your candidate, I'm going to take the time out of your candidate for your, you know, your good thing. And I, but on my back, because then I had to sit down with my back to the audience. And I said, but I'm going to need some help. And on forcing this, and of course my eyes went to your mother, to Mrs. Bush. <laughs> and I said, Mrs. Bush, would, would you mind helping me enforce the rules? I wouldn't mind at all. And boy, you couldn't hear a pin drop in that <laughs> in 90 minutes. And, and from then on, they have, we, we, if somebody makes any noise, it's an accident. And, uh, they're, and everybody's abided by that. For, and the reason it's important, in my opinion, because you see the primary debates and you see they're, they're, they're kind of competing pep rallies and, and all that sort of stuff. I think they, anything that influences or changes in any way what a candidate would say, I think is interference. And uh, you ought to get rid of it. And that's outside noise. And uh, if, a, if a candidate gets in a debate and starts playing to the crowd, I think it could affect what he or she says. And that's, that's my view of it, at least. 
You've seen a lot of those primary debates. What impact do you think an audience has? It can be extremely negative, as Jim just said, if they're allowed to simply cheer and shout and, and heckle as they did in this primary season that just came up. I, I think the fact that Jim was able to create this really tradition now that at least at the presidential debates between the parties, there will be silence and from the audience. It's very important to have an audience, by the way. I think just for the, for the candidates themselves to be comfortable with the event. I mean, it would be very sterile and, and, un, and difficult to deal with if you didn't have an audience. But I think Jim's given us a great gift by creating yeah. this tradition. There's a couple of techniques they use to facilitate that too. They never light anybody in the audience. So you don't, you don't see anybody. And, uh, and so the, and the candidate does, has, has no eye contact with anybody in the audience. That's intentional. So you're not, you know, there's not somebody to look to, you know, except, except I, you, you can see people, right? You, you could, you, when, when President Bush was, was debating, you could see, you could see you, couldn't you, couldn't you, Mrs. Bush? I mean, you, did you have eye contact? You must have, you were right on the road. But beyond that, you, you, you couldn't do it, and uh, that was very, that's also critical, a small thing, but it, uh, it helps, helps facilitate it. The debates can obviously benefit a candidate or prove a pitfall. Uh, let's take a look at President Carter's thinking uh, during the debates uh, about his strategy. With the election still more than a month away, President Carter's campaign managers continued to press for his own face-to-face -face meeting with Ronald Reagan. I wanted a lot of debates. I wanted three or four debates at least. Why? Why did you want so many debates? Because I thought that I was much more a master of the, uh, of the of subject matter. I knew that he was a master of, uh, of the medium. Perfectly at ease uh, before the television cameras, I knew that I was not a master of the medium. And I thought that if we could get past uh, the one hour and go to uh, maybe four, five, six hours on uh, television, that substance rather than style would be more uh, prevalent. Senator Gregg, I think it's fair to say that uh, President Bush did not want a lot of debates. <laughs> as you said, they gave him a headache. Well, what was your strategy in, in terms of as we prepared him, as we, we, we met in a lot of places. We actually started in Kenny Bunkport with a session in a couple of days in June. We, we met at his ranch in Crawford. We went to a little church for a formal debate practice late one night that I remember did not go particularly well, but what was, what was your thinking about, it, it was nine o'clock at night, I think it was bedtime, right? <laughs> so. Well, basically, uh, first off, the president was, uh, then governor, was incredibly intense about his preparation. Uh, and this was not a casual undertaking. In fact, I recall him, uh, the president saying to me, uh, we were driving around somewhere in May or something, and he said, you know, there are really only three major events left in this campaign. One is who I pick for vice president, Two is my convention speech, and three of the debates, and I am going to be prepared for the debates. And so my job as Al Gore was basically to torment him. I mean, I was, my job was to essentially do what Al Gore did best, which was attack, be on the offensive, and whenever he gave me an opening, make sure that he paid a price for the opening in the debate prep. And, uh, you know, after a while, that became tedious for everybody except me. I was having a good time. <laughs> um, but that, that, that's the job of the stand in to basically carry that, deliver that message in, an, in a very precise way. And, and one of the things I tried to do was anticipate where Al Gore would go and where he would attack. And if you'll remember the church event, uh, which I remember rather vividly and some other folks do, uh, basically it was the last major debate prep, the next day we had one, but the last major debate prep before the actual event. And Al Gore had come up with this line that he'd used three or four times. He hadn't used it very, in very high visibility public events, but he used it, and it was an extremely effective line on tax policy. And I thought he was setting it up for the debates. And so, first off, how we got started in the debate was a little chunky because we arrived late, about a half an hour late, and everybody was a little unsettled. President upset. Bush loves when people are late. <laughs> yeah, we got lost getting there. We were in a separate car, and as I walked in, I said, but Al Gore always arrives late, and nobody smiled, nobody laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and so after about four questions that were perfunctory, I started attacking on this line, and I attacked three times of this line in a row. And I, it was very aggressive. And, and finally he said, no, no. And the president went into whatever he was talking about at the time, but he did not respond to the attack line. And you said, hold it, we've got to stop here, and we've got to address how we're going to deal with that issue. 
and that was the end of debate prep. That, we actually never reconvened. <laughs> as I recall, we never reconvened. We came back to try again the next day. <laughs> and he was spectacular. <laughs> I learned a big lesson uh, during our debate prep, and it was don't mess with the Presidential Debate Commission. Uh, the commission had proposed three very formal debates, and we felt that then Governor Bush would come across and it would be more interesting for the audience in less formal settings. And Al Gore had said he would debate anytime, any place, anywhere. And so Carl Rove and I hatched this strategy to take him up on it. And we said, you know, we, we can only, we'll do one of these presidential commission debates and then we'll do Meet the Press with Tim Russert and Larry King Live. And that'll give a variety of formats. And Governor Bush was very skeptical. I remember him looking at me and saying, uh, you guys better make sure you know what you're doing. Well, it turned out we didn't know what we were doing. And <laughs> the press really roasted us for that. And we, after about a week, uh, then Governor Bush uh, accepted the three presidential debates. But one of the things we were able to get out of that is Don Evans, who is here tonight, who negotiated the debates for us, was able to negotiate some different formats so that we didn't have to do all three debates formally standing at podiums. In your experience, what difference does that make? The sit-down interview, the town hall audience participation, do the formats make a difference? Yes, yes indeed they do. And in, in ways that, um, once I say this, everybody's gonna re realize what a huge difference it can be. The difference in, in, in having people seated at a table versus standing at podiums, podium, 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 <laughs> um, has to do with, first of all, if, you, uh, if you're seated, you tend to have a, a more civilized discussion. It's hard to sit right next to somebody and, and beat them up, and uh, easier standing at a podium. For the moderator, you can use your body language. I've learned after all these years, I can shut somebody up with my eyes but I have to be close to them in order to do that. And you can move things around. As the, bo the bottom line is this. It makes more and more civilized exchange if they're seated. And you can cover a lot more ground because you can, you can go, just kind of go, you don't have to say, uh, you can just turn and, and it'll, it'll move. And, it'll, and you can, the moderator can stay out of it a lot easier that way and keep the thing going. Now, the, the town hall, uh, the, the history of the town hall, the reason they have town hall uh, debates was because Bill Clinton wanted, wanted um, town hall. He thought that would be a good thing. And He'd be they, good at engaging yeah, with good, the audience. It'd be a good, at, a good thing. And um, the difference there is, and I did several of those, what, uh, I, have a mix, I have mixed feelings about them, but I will, I will express it. I will not express my feelings, but I just express what others have said. Um, that uh, they're, they're about two-thirds phony because you, you get people in a room and uh, what they, how, how we do it is you sit, you sit and you okay, write two questions that you, for, for each candidate. Well, then all those questions are given to Billy Bob Moderator and Billy Bob Moderator puts all of the, these questions and puts them all together and then decides which ones are gonna be asked. Then you, then you have to make sure that, the, that there's diversity in the group. You can't have all uh, young white women asking all the questions. You got, you know, so you gotta, you know, it's, it becomes a kind of an exercise in, um, uh, in things other than debate. However, the, the good thing that comes out of it out of, is that, you, that people tend to ask questions that professional moderators or professional journalists do not ask. And if the moderator has sense enough to realize that and use it, in other words, get, here's a question I wouldn't ask, you wouldn't say that, but you, there's a question I'm sure as hell wouldn't ask. But, uh, and then the, the uh, it, 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 can be, it can be meaningful if, it, uh, if, it, uh, if it's handled right. Did you have a favorite and it, did it affect your preparation style, the format of the debate? Not really, I, you know, Jim would be the expert on this because uh, as Gore, I was just doing what Gore said, so I didn't really care what <laughs> format I was in. <laughs> Debates are, are unique and unlike really any other political opportunity. They're more suited to some candidates than others. And here is what President Bush 41 thought. Ironically, the one candidate who has participated in more nationally televised debates than any other also is the candidate 
who most loathed having to debate, George Bush. Are you a little anxious about the next debate, and are you anxious about Mr. Bush's performance tonight? <laughs> He's not I am. <laughs> you participated in one vice presidential debate and five presidential debates. Generally, what kind of experience was it for you? Ugly. I don't like them. Why not? Well, partially I wasn't too good at them. Secondly, there's some of it's contrived, show business. You prompt to get the answers ahead of time. Now, this guy, you got Bernie Shaw on the panel, and here's what he's probably going to ask you. And you got Leslie Stahl over here, and she's known to go for this and that. And you can, I'm going to be sure I remember what Leslie's going to ask and get this answer. Now, that answer is not quite concise enough, so it's, there's a certain artificiality to it, lack of spontaneity to it. And uh, I don't know, I just... I just felt uncomfortable about it. <laughs> I remember being overwhelmed uh, when I was put in charge nominally. We had a lot of people working on it of the debate preparation process. And the first memo I got about the debates from someone who had been through previous ones was from Bob Zellick, who was sort of helping our policy director, Josh Bolton, help the process. And he identified something like 40 key topics that we had to really know and thoroughly prepare for. And I remember just being overwhelmed. I mean, really complicated things from you know, the Middle East to tax policy to uh, Medicaid and Medicare. How do, you, how do you decide what to ask about and, and what, how to rank the order of importance? Well, the, uh, it took, took some learning on my part uh, and, uh, to figure it out. Uh, first of all, I realized, because I made a mistake a couple of times before, I, and that's how I learned, is making a mistake. I would go, well, this is a really terrific subject, and I will get to that later on. And that terrific subject, because you cut from the bottom when there's a time problem, I didn't ever get to. So I, I learned that you, know, you, 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 you sort them out in terms of importance. The other test that I use, which I'm not sure any other moderator does this, uh, I, I always felt that, that uh, if the uh, candidates agree on something, essentially agree on it, then uh, skip through it. I mean, don't waste your time saying, I agree, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, no, 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 no. The, the priority is to, is to show the differences between and among the candidates, not their agreement. Uh, you can make the point of it if it's a big enough, if it's a big enough deal. Um, the other, the other uh, rule uh, in, in making decision, and making, for me, making a decision about preparing for a debate, <clears throat> here again, it took me a while to figure this out, that it isn't prepare enough so you can write some really nifty, tough questions. Uh, it's, it's so you can listen to the answers. So if candidate A says something that's important, you know it's important. And, or this is, uh, he's, he, he or she said this many, many, there's no, nothing here or whatever. And, and you, you, so you do your homework to, and, and it takes a lot. This is, as, as, as uh, 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 everybody has said, every, every candidate, every president has participated in these, these things are really tense. And there's a lot riding on them, and everybody who's involved in them is, 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 really, is really, really tense. So I realized that as a moderator, I had to figure out a way to be calm enough to, uh, to listen. And the only way you can do that is just do your homework, enormous amounts of homework. What does the candidate, what does the candidate, uh, what does the candidate said about this issue? What does the candidate, what does the other candidate say? What, what, you know, what is, what is a logical question to ask that is simple? In other words, that, that the audience can understand. Some long, involved question, you know, these, say, we always say, do you agree that the, blah, 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 and then all that to say, yes. <laughs> You got to ask questions that get the candidate to talk, and um, uh, and it's uh, it, it's it, and and sometimes if a candidate doesn't want it, the other thing you have to ha every moderator has to understand, and I, I'm sure President Bush would agree with this that, uh, and I could give you a lot of examples of this, but where if somebody doesn't want to answer the question, you can stay there for hours asking follow-up questions, and he or she is not going to answer the question. 
and uh, and the, but you if you if somebody doesn't want to answer the question, the moderator has a responsibility, I think, to make that clear to the audience without saying, "Hey, why aren't you answering the question?" You know, <laughs> oh, you didn't answer the question. No, just there are ways to keep asking the question and, and make it clear that they are, and, and then just move on. Right. They, and then let the audience say, hey, he didn't answer the question, but without you without your having to say it. And uh, that, that's hard work. Senator Gregg, in your experience, are most of the, being an observer of all this, are most of the questions asked at debates the most relevant policy pressing issues facing the country? Well, no, because you don't know what the policy is going to be that hits you as president in many instances. They're the, certainly the topics of the day, but uh, often for the presidency that succeeds the election, the issues are, that were taken up in the debates are almost uh, irrelevant. Uh, but you deal with the issues that are, are current and on top, the topic of the day. I had one other rule, uh, Karen, uh, that I decided, and here again, it was my rule. I mean, I didn't, I didn't check it with anybody and I didn't tell anybody. I, um, <laughs> I decided that I would only ask the candidates about issues that had been raised in the campaign, not to suddenly come out of nowhere and ask them about something uh, that, that hadn't even come up. That, to, that it, was, it, was a, it, it was my responsibility to help the, the American people understand the positions that were in the can and not 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 go off on some tangent and uh, and every once in a while I'd come up with a question and I would I would think oh wow that would be a terrific thing oh whoop, 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 whoop. didn't come up in the campaign so I'm not, I wasn't going to introduce it that because here again it was toward the end of the thing if if there had been some huge thing I probably would have done it but it, it, there was never anything that uh, that came up that I thought was huge enough to bring up out of nowhere. I don't think these debates are usually decided on the policy discussion anyway. I think they're decided on demeanor, presentation, whether the people become comfortable with the way the, the candidate is making his or her points. Uh, the, the, philosophical, the deeply philosophical issues, people have already made their minds up on that, and if they're going to vote those issues, they've already picked a candidate who supports them. So the undecided vote, which is the key vote in this audience, is that's not the, it's usually not the policy issues that decide it. I agree with that. I agree. And we've, we saw that example of uh, the first uh, Kennedy-Nixon debate. Well, there was a debate, uh, a, a, a Bush-Gore debate, first Bush-Gore debate, which I moderated. It was in Boston, and it had split screens, and uh, President Bush was, was, was talking, and Al Gore was sighing and going, rolling his eyes, like and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, I can do and, that. Yeah, do yeah, he did. Yeah, did you teach him how to? <laughs> Well, the, the interesting thing about that was that it, exactly what happened in, in Kennedy Nixon happened in that case. Uh, the people who saw that on television thought that, uh, that President Bush had won that debate. People who listened on the radio thought it was closer and maybe Gore had, run the, had won the debate, just like happened with Kennedy, Kennedy Nixon. Uh, and one personal thing for, for me in, in, the, uh, in the Boston debate, all that stuff that Gore was doing, I also had another, I have another rule. I had another rule here again, I didn't tell anybody. Did you uh, write your rules down anywhere? No, I, but I passed them on. Maybe you should pass them on. I have passed them on. <laughs> Is that if you, I, I always had a policy that I always looked at the candidate who was talking, never at the candidate who was was reacting. That way, if, because the candidate is desperate to have eye contact with somebody, and if the other guy, sorry, and, and I didn't want to influence the, the reaction. So if I, so, but as a consequence, after this Bush uh, uh, Gore debate in Boston, I'm walking out with my, some of my kids were there, and I was walking with one of my daughters who was then in college, a really smart young woman, and she's, we're walking out, and she says, Dad, wasn't that something that Gore did? And I, I stopped, and I said, you know, 
Trust me, Gore did nothing in that debate in terms that you would, I said, what are you talking about? What did Gore do? What are you talking about? And she said, oh, the way he sighed, no, 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 no. And of course, I hadn't, I was the close, I was from here to the edge of the <laughs> thing. You had no idea. And they were, you know, like, like that. And I didn't see any of that. And she said, smart daughter that she is, well, dad, that's going to be the lead of the story yeah. of the debate. And I said, oh, of course she was absolutely right. I, said, I actually privately called that debate lies and size because, because of the size and then also there were a number of exaggerations that at the next debate, oh, yeah. Vice President Gore had to basically apologize and say he'd exaggerated some things in the first and, debate. And interestingly enough, the ground rules of that debate, which Don Evans did negotiate very well, was that there would be no split screens. And when the split screen started, everybody in our room was saying, whoa, they're doing split screens. That's not supposed to be done. Well, it ended up helping us. But actually, the, the most significant event, I think, in that series of debates was when Al Gore walked across the stage. Well, and we have a clip of that All moment, right, but what we referred to as the body bump moment. Yeah, okay. So let's take a look at that. <laughs> so I was prowling a little bit, but so was Gore. Well, the difference is, is that I can get it done. The, that I can get something positive done on behalf of the people. That's what the question in this campaign is about. And he approached me at first, and I wasn't certain what was happening, and then it looked like it was gonna be the body bump, the chest, the chest bump. It's not only what's your philosophy and what's your position on issues, but can you get things done? <laughs> and I believe I can. I think as I recall, I, uh, I gave him kind of an odd expression, kind of a look, you know. It was, uh, it was, I couldn't tell if he was trying to threaten me, in which case it amused me even more, or whether I, you know, I wasn't sure what his motives were. All I can tell you is, is that I think if you review the tape, you'll see kind of a bemused expression on my face. And, and you just walked away. I did. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Well, the other option was to, you know, go through a huge chest bump, which in itself would have <laughs> maybe decided the debate. In which case. I loved that bemused nod. That was yeah, just the best put, put down ever. Yeah. Senator Greg, you actually had anticipated that that would happen. Well, in the first debate prep, we did a Kenny bunk. I actually took a card across the street, across the stage and put it in front of the governor and said, sign this. It was some ridiculous pledge for some ridiculous purpose. And, you know, it didn't go that well. And then later, Lazio did that against Hillary Clinton running for the Senate, and it was a total disaster. So I knew he wouldn't use a card. But Don Evans came up to me about in one of the debate prep exercises at, at Crawford and said, you know, I think he's going to try to get in the, in the governor's space. And I said, you're absolutely right he is, because he think, because Al Gore felt he was bigger and stronger and more virile, and that was just his personality. He was, he's this guy who went to Harvard and looked down at anybody who wore cowboy boots. And so he basically, I, I felt he would try to come over to the, to the, to the governor and, and, and physically get in his space and try to help him out with the answer sort of thing. Well, we practiced that only once, as I recall. Now, I understand Rob Portman did it in the one event debate prep that I wasn't available for. And in that one exercise, the president did the exact same thing he did there. And he said, well, we don't need to practice this anymore. <laughs> what were you thinking? I'll tell you what I was thinking. I'll tell you it was the worst moment of any debate I've ever been in. <laughs> I'm sitting there watching this happen. I thought, holy wah wah. <laughs> I'm going to have to go and separate these up, up out of this chair and sit and go like that. I thought, oh my, it's the one thing I hadn't prepared for, Karen. <laughs> well, it cost him, the, I, I think it was the turning point of the whole debate and the election myself. I think it just so showed that there was one person on the screen who was ready to be president and ready to be a leader, and there was another person who was still dealing with how to get out of high school. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of debates hinge on, on memorable lines, what we call zingers. Um, and I remember in our campaign, we were always trying to come up with them. We, our speech writers wrote a bunch of lines. We even looked for some, we reached out to some comic writers. We, I was always trying to come up with lines. I'm not sure we ever came up with a, with a real huge one, but let's hear from President Bush about zingers. Zingers, it, 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 I think when, when um... You know, Ronald Reagan in 1980 came up with some zingers, and that became, you know, the, the measure of success to a certain extent. I'm beginning to think not only did he invent the Internet, 
but he invented the calculator. <laughs> it's fuzzy math. I can't let the man continue with fuzzy math. Unless there are, is the zinger, or the kind of the cute line, or the whatever, the, the quotable moment, there's no victor, in a sense. You were debating with Vice President Gore about the math of your tax policy, and I, we had talked about inventing the internet, but I don't remember, I think the inventing the calculator was off the cuff. That was you at that, at that moment, and fuzzy math. That was the first time we'd heard that as well. Do you remember, Senator Gray? I, I just remember we never really had, it's more, more the candidate's ability to react. Did, did you, we, we were, practice campaigns? We were a uniquely dull group when it came to that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, his, his support team. <laughs> and uh, so really we left the one-liners to the, Governor, and he was, came up, and he had a number of really excellent ones, which I'd never heard before in debate practice. Right. Certainly I, this one, and then there were a couple more. I remember thinking, where'd that come from? That's really good. <laughs> Let's look at a few of President Bush 41's best lines. He wants to give the wealthiest taxpayers in this country a five year, $40 billion tax break, and he also uh, wants to spend a lot of money on additional programs. Uh, if he keeps this up, uh, it's going to be the Joe Azuzu of, of American politics. Uh, is this the time to unleash our one-liners? <laughs> that answer was about as clear as Boston Harbor. Now, um, <laughs> let me, uh, let me, uh, let me. I'd hope this had been a little friendlier in the evening. I'd wanted to hitchhike a ride home in his tank with him, but uh, <laughs> I think now we're... Uh, <laughs> And obviously, President Reagan is, is fondly remembered for being great on camera and with those zingers. Let's take a look at that. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> Was that one you were laying for? I mean, I you... never, never thought about it coming out. That was really off the top of my head. Yeah. Was that when, when you knew you were in trouble? When yeah, he, said... he got the audience with that. Yeah, yeah. That uh, I could tell that one hurt. Did that strike you as a as obviously a pre-programmed line? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if you if if TV can tell the truth, as you say it can, you will see that I was smiling. But I think if you come in close, you'll see some tears coming down. Because I, because I <laughs> that. Senator Gregg, you and I were present in Nashua, New Hampshire, for a primary debate. I was there as a reporter covering President Bush 41. You were there as a, I believe, helping his campaign. Yeah. And that was a very that memorable. That was the ultimate singer. I mean, that basically won an election. And what happened was, I was doing the advance work. My father was running the campaign. In fact. Uh, soon to be President, Vice President Bush and Barbara were staying at my parents' house where they basically lived during that campaign and as they were, when they were in New Hampshire. And uh, I had advanced it, so I, we had worked out an agreement with the local newspaper to get a one-on-one -on -one debate after Iowa because there were five or six very strong candidates in the field and we just wanted to narrow it down to President with, uh, George H. Bush, 41, and uh, and Ronald Reagan, and so we set up this one-on-one -on -one debate, and I went over to the high school where I was going to be held to advance it about five o'clock, and I noticed that the, that the Dole team was there, that the Baker team was there, that the Kemp team was there, that Phil Crane's team was there, and I said, oh, something's going on here that we don't know about, and so I called Jim Baker, who was running the campaign. I said, Jim, you better get over here pretty quickly, or I said, Mr. Baker, probably. You better get over here pretty quickly, because there's something going on we don't know about. So he came over and he met with Lynn Knopfsinger, who was running uh, Reagan's campaign, and he was kind enough to take me in the room. There were some words exchanged, and Knopfsinger said, these candidates are going to be here tonight. And and Jim Baker said, well, they're not coming up on the stage. Well, as you know, what happened was that uh, 41 and, and Reagan were on the stage, and the moderator, a man named Mr. Green, who was the editor of the paper, uh, 
Ronald Reagan said, let's invite all the other candidates up. Well, the other candidates were out in the hallway, out in the, <laughs> and they were lined up against the wall like it was, you know, they were on a, some sort of a police lineup, uh, all leaning against the wall. <laughs> and they, these were very significant individuals, and they were, they were just props, and, and, and President Reagan said, bring them on up here, bring them on up here. So they all walked up on the stage, and then uh, John Breen said, turn off his microphone to Ronald Reagan, and Mr. Reagan said, Governor Reagan said, I paid for this microphone, Mr. Green. And that ended the debate right there. It went on for another hour, but the, the other folks walked <laughs> off the stage. Did you know at the time that it was over? It was over. It was so over. It was just so obvious. I mean, it was, it was a turning event. Uh, it was one of those things that happens occasionally that really does decide an election. Jim, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the recent interview of the two presidential candidates uh, by Matt Lauer. It was not a debate, um, but it was back-to-back -back interviews, and, and Matt was criticized uh, for failing to challenge Donald Trump on some of the misstatements he made. What's your take on that? Is that the moderator's role in a debate? No, no in my opinion. Uh, but uh, in Matt, what you said it. What Matt Lauer was doing, he did back-to-back, one-on-one interviews. And it's a very different situation. I'm asking ask you a question. You say something that I, I know, because I've done my homework, is wrong or has another, needs to be followed up on. I won't say is wrong, but it's followed up on. Then that's my responsibility as an interviewer to follow up on it and stay with it as long as I possibly can until til I feel I'm comfortable professionally uh, to move on. They, they called, they, they mislabeled, uh, in my opinion, NBC did, mislabeled what uh, uh, Lauer was. They said he was moderating this forum. He wasn't moderating a forum. And, uh, uh, and the people who moderate, in my opinion, you have two people, d d d two or more people debating. And the moderator's job is to get the candidates to do the truth telling or the fact checking or whatever. So if, if you're the candidate and, and Senator Gregg is the candidate, the two of you are the candidates, I'm the moderator, I ask you a question and, you, and your answer is, is a little bit fuzzy to me, I would then say, Senator Gregg, do you see it the same way? Do you, do you, do you see the facts the same way? And then you would, you know, da, 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 da. I, as a moderator, would never do any challenging and say, oh, well, they're, 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 well, you said on th February 3rd, blah, 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 blah. That's not the moderator's job. The moderator is, is there to help, help the, uh, is, is to do the, is to get the candidates uh, to engage and to get them to do the, do the hard work. And uh, specifically in this 2016 uh, 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 thing, where there's been a lot of questions as a result of the Matt Lauer. They, oh, my moderators are not going to, they're, they're going to fact check uh, uh, one of the candidates in particular and uh, she'll remain nameless. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the, 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 it's going to be, people need to understand that that's not what the moderator's there to do. He, he or she is there to make sure that the, can, the other candidate has an opportunity to respond and fact check and make, and, and make it go and keep the flow going and whatever, whatever it needs to be done. That's my, that's my re now here again, I know it sounds weird, but there are people who disagree with me about this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying that I'm a communicator, yet when it comes to this current presidential election, I am absolutely speechless. Um, everything I thought I knew about politics has been turned on its head. Um, what are you all expecting for, for the debate on Monday night? Senator Gregg? Uh. <laughs> I, I think the moderator hit it right on the head tonight. I'm speechless. I, I have no idea. And it's going to be the most watched event probably in the, in the history of television in the United States. I suspect it will exceed the Super Bowls. Uh, and the American people are, are befuddled by this election. And you've got two candidates who have a negative that exceeds 50%. They're having trouble sorting out how they pick their next president. So these debates are going to be very important. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get more from you on this? Well, I, I, not specifically, because I think if you, were to, if you were to analyze what's happened up till now both, for both of these candidates and then say, okay, 
how are they going to conduct themselves in this debate? Now, keep in mind the format. The format of these debates has evolved through the years. And, uh, and I've, been, I've been part of it. In other words, I've implemented the, the evolution in some ways. Uh, now they're, 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 the candidates can talk directly to each other. In fact, they are encouraged to talk directly to each other, ask each other questions. They divide the subject matter. You can, one segment could run 15 minutes or even longer. If uh, if you if it if it's moving and all that sort of stuff, I was criticized here again. Hard to believe I was criticized for 2012 because I let I was accused of letting Romney run over uh, Obama. Well, the fact of the matter is they started mixing it up, and that was what we wanted. That was what the commission and what those two candidates were told was we we, we were there to. Blah, blah, blah. At any rate, that's going to where there's going to be a lot of that. Uh, between these two candidates, but what kind is it going to be? I mean, you got to, okay, here's Hillary Clinton, who, is, who has a certain kind of uh, personality, and then here is Donald Trump, who has a certain kind of personality. Both of them uh, have, uh, they're about as different uh, politically uh, as well as personality and, poli and, 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 uh, and, and a lot of other ways. They are very, very different people. Uh, gender, not even, don't even count gender, but that's also there. And uh, so they also realize that probably everybody who's going to vote in this election is going to watch either the whole, maybe they won't watch it live, you know, on Monday night, but they'll see a piece of it. It'll some, and it'll be covered up one side and this new world order, I mean, the amplification of what happens on Monday night is going to be enormous. And, and is it going to be perceived that he was this, or is it going to be perceived and reported that he was that? Is it going to be perceived that she was this or that, or this or that, or what, or that, or what? Boop, boop, boop. And, and uh, oh, now I feel differently, or do I feel the same? Am I there? And it's going to be a, a, an, a, an event of commotion, uh, <laughs> unlike anything. It, it could be a real free-for-all. <laughs> Although, it also could be very quiet because it may be in both candidates' interests to keep things quiet. You just never know. And, or it could just blow up and be something that, that uh, we hadn't expected to ever see in our lives. But so. <laughs> well, it will be interesting television watching. <laughs> so I think I'll close with a question from our audience. Uh, how much do you think the debates really influence voters? My view is that uh, for the 10 to 15, maybe in this election, 20% of people who are undecided, it is a determinative event. And I think uh, it, these debates will be determinative, as I think the third debate was. Well, all three of them were in the President and Gore situation. Uh, and so I, I just think that the folks who haven't made their mind up, this is going to be their opportunity to, to really evaluate the candidates and come to a conclusion. And they're not a large percentage of the American population right now, but they are the people who are going to decide the next presidency. Final I just, word. I would, okay. One word, final word? No, not oh. more than one word. Well, I could. <laughs> final thought. How about amen? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything the senator said. I, I, in fact, you could go through each one of these uh, uh, campaigns and see how the debates affected the outcome, confirmed an outcome that was already set in, in, in pretty much in stone, uh, uh, or it can reverse uh, reverse things not dramatically, but they can you know it, they 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 are huge. I agree with, agree with what Senator Greg said earlier. It was, you were you were quoting uh, I think President Bush that the three important things. <coughs> Well, the debates is one of them. And it is, it, is, it is not a television show. That's what I always tell the moderators. You know, this is not a television program. This is a, a, a critical event in the course of our democracy and the election of the President of the United States, which is the single most powerful job in the world. And uh, this, these things are serious. They matter. 
And uh, they are, it's not entertainment. Yeah, it may be entertaining on Monday, but, it, but it's <laughs> under. <laughs> that's not their purpose. And uh, uh, anyhow, it's a little more than amen, isn't it? Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all for a amen. fascinating discussion. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jim.